Welcome to the interview series for the Cypress Dome Society. My name is Emilio Carrero. I'm a student here at the University of Central Florida, and with me is my co-host, Daniel Isaiah. Hey, everybody. Great to be here. Well, today we have a special guest, the poet, teacher, writer, ambassador for poetry, Tim Siebels. Tim has written several collections of poetry. He has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Promise Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center, an Open Voice Award from the National Writers Voice Project, and was a 2012 National Book Award nominee for his collection, Fast Animal. With that being said, I'd like to bring in the man himself. Tim, thank you for joining us. Hello, hello, Danielle and uh, Emilio. It's good to be here. So, Tim, I wanted to start with this quote I read about one of your previous collections, but I feel like it's still very relevant to your collection, Fast Animals. Uh, the reviewer Joey Rubin said, If Frank O'Hara's meandering monologues were meant to capture the performative design of abstract expressionism and Allen Ginsberg's forceful riffing was meant to mimic the jazz stylings of Charlie Parker, then the back-bending, image-splicing lyrical na narratives in Tim Siebel's sixth collection of poetry, Buffalo Head Solo, should invoke the fast-flipping frames of Hanna-Barbera animation. Siebel's cartoon imagery and cartoonish muscling of language, however, are not just trying to make us laugh, which is to say, Siebel's is playful, but he's not kidding around. So my question is, do you see your work as embodying a particular style or movement? Oh, man. Boy, that's some question. Mm -hmm. Um... Uh, I'll try to be as, as, as brief as possible. I mean, I'm influenced by lots and lots of things, you know. Uh, I loved cartoons as a kid, you know. I was a pretty faithful watcher of uh, after-school cartoons and, of course, Saturday morning cartoons and what I could squeeze out of Sunday morning, which was not that much. But, yeah, I was committed to cartoons. So to some extent, I guess it's not strange that that, that cartoon imagery or – the possibilities of, of elastic reality that cartoons embody yeah. would be part of the way I write. Um, but I would say that consciously, no. Um, I loved uh, Poets of the Black Arts Movement, particularly Gil Scott Heron, um, Nikki Giovanni, The Last Poets, uh, probably who you know. Um, uh, and then, you know, I went to undergraduate school at SMU, um, my professors were all white dudes, and they introduced me to, you know, gosh, you name it, uh, Mark Strand, Merwin, who we were talking about earlier, um, and Sexton, uh, gosh, we could go down there, Wallace Stevens, uh, Ginsburg, of course, um, but, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and so I think that my sensibility is some kind of hybrid of black arts uh, poets and uh, the contemporaries who were um, uh, defining poetry, American poetry in the 70s and 80s perhaps. Um, but uh, their influences and the way I write wouldn't be a, I certainly haven't made a choice to write like anyone, but there are people that I admire and I think the people that you that you love uh, influence the way you you write. I mean, whether you want them to or not. I mean, Pablo Neruda, very large uh, 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 part of my own thinking. Octavio Paz, also um, Lorca. You know, uh, so those are people that I read a lot, and you know, Merwin very heavily, and uh, and then the poet I, you know, I the persona yeah. poet, you know, AI. Um, which means love in Japanese. Um, I mean, the reason I, I started writing Persona poems really was because of I. Um, she has a, a dark, she's looking at the world through, I think, generally a darker lens than I am. This is not to say I don't have my own uh, uh, deep shadows uh, and wandering in me, but, but I gave me the, the sense that one's voice could encompass most anything. You know, so cartoons were an interest of mine, not an interest of hers. And so my first persona poems were cartoon poems. And then from there, other things that emerged, of course. Okay, and I think it's really interesting what you mentioned, going going to school and being with 
all of these, as you said, these white dudes. I mean, how <laughs> how was that for you? You know, being so influenced by the black arts movement and then coming in and getting this totally kind of other experience. Yeah, it's funny. Um, at the time, you know, when you're younger, you're just you just go from thing to thing. You don't really think this is a very sharp contrast to my earlier experience. You know, you don't think about it. You know, you just kind of do it. Um, now, in retrospect, it's kind of fascinating, you know. But at the time, I just thought, okay, so these are poems too. All right. And I was just trying to, what I like. And the other thing was true is that um, Michael Ryan, who was my very first workshop teacher, um, and then there was then after that was Jack Myers, the late Jack Myers now, and John Scoyles, who was still uh, among living. And they were all pretty progressive dudes politically. I mean, it wasn't like I was dealing with a bunch of Republican uh, poets, that would have been, now that, I would have noticed that contrast pretty quickly. So the poets that they were introducing us to were, you know, in, in their various ways, um, radical in various ways, you know. I think about Morton Marcus, for example, um, as I said earlier, Neruda and those political poems that Neruda wrote. And, you know, there were lots of things like that. Um, uh, I'm just th trying to think of anybody else. I ah, certainly, um, but there were people like, um, God, no, I'm blank on folks, but uh, there was uh, there were they had political flavorings in a lot of the poems that they talked to us about, and then there was also just the the, the craziness of the imagination, and I think about, I mean, in part, the imagination, of course, is the seed of all revolution, right? All revolution is seeded first in someone's mind that says. I don't think it's that way. I imagine it this way. And so uh, I think about people like Russell Edson, for example, uh, who are who was so insane. But basically what they do is give you um, permission to see the world in terms that you weren't given by the culture that you were born into, be that specifically the black culture or the larger American culture. I mean, Edson was totally out of bounds. He was like a Martian in some ways, you know. And, uh, and I would say this would be true of, of the poets that I love best in various respects. I mean, you know, Sexton was also interplanetary in her way. Um, uh, I, absolutely, with her, like, with this, like, million voices in her mind. Um, uh, you know, there's just lots of people that made me think that language could embody just about anything if you could manage the, the skill uh, to do it that the language was not limited, that the limits were in your own head and your own capacity. And so I would imagine that uh, that even though it was, you know, certainly my, my original um, teachers were like, I mean, even though they were just teachers on the radio or, or, or um, in a bookstore, uh, you'd hear these poems by these uh, more radical um, street, if I can use that loosely, poets. Uh, it was still on the same continuum with the uh, stuff that was happening in the classroom back then. Well, you mentioned politics and uh, you know, being around progressive people. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you said before in a, in a previous interview that uh, you said poetry, if it's going to be really engaging and engaged, has to come at the issues of our lives from all kinds of angles. And I feel like in this book, Fast Animal, uh, that's something that you're doing a lot, is that you're not just talking about these issues, but you're trying to come at them from different angles. Was that kind of a conscious effort? Well, I mean, in as much as, I mean, the thing, that quote that you uh, just recalled, I mean, in as much as that's part of my thinking, I guess is conscious. But when you're writing, you're just writing. You know what I mean? You can't really say... I must try a different angle. You know, you really can't write that way. At least I can't. I can't really write that way. You know, some people may be able to be deliberate and say, I've tried this, now I will try that. But that's not really how I work. I like to think that um, uh, you write from different places because you live in different places in your mind. I mean, the Blade poems, for example, you know, um, there's a kind of seething rage in Blade that, of course, is part of my own psyche. Of course it is, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then there are other things that are that are uh, maybe have a softer touch to them, but still are informed by a certain kind of, of uh, frustration, um, a certain kind of uh, uh, unrelenting irritation about the way things go in the world, the way things go in uh, uh, America and in the larger world as well. 
Um, but uh, I think what I've tried to do, and I'm not sure, again, whether this is a thing I can do consciously on a daily basis, but certainly in the way I think about poetry, I think that poetry should have a, the broadest spectrum uh, of concern. And so given that as a backdrop, I think maybe it works its way into my work because it's something that I really believe in. I mean, I believe that we have lots of people in us, really, lots of uh, lots of voices in our heads and lots of of sensations about how life is. And so I, I think the poems then become, um, you know, proxies for all these various voices in your mind. You know, so that's that. I'm not sure it's a conscious decision on a daily basis, but certainly if you ask me on any given day, am I interested in a broad range of voicing in poetry, I would say yes. So given that, maybe I'm conscious of it some somewhat. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, especially having you mentioned earlier with um, mm -hmm. the cartoons, the, the phrase that you said was, I think, elastic reality, and it seems to mm -hmm. really connect to me this idea of, you know, elastic reality and different characters and cartoons and then kind of all these different perspectives. Is that something that you kind of are aware of or play with at all? Um, it's such an interesting connection. You know, it's funny. As I said, I think uh, for better and for worse, mostly I'm just writing by what draws me, you know. So I, I've stumbled into the Blade, the, the graphic novel, and then the movies, uh, and and given the circumstances of the, the Bush years, I, I needed to be able to talk in some unflinching way about the possibilities of a violent response to what is evil in the world. And I, it'd be very difficult to do that in a voice that might be per perceived as my voice. It could be done. There are poets who do it. But I, you know, but there's a certain kind of light such a poem might be cast in that would perhaps make a, a reader, any reader, less receptive. So the idea of letting Blade be a proxy for me, I think, first of all, you know, someone might be curious about Blade, you know, and what would, what's, how's Blade doing in a book of poems? Um, you know, and so and so that allows you maybe a, a way in uh, to the reader's mind that that might be very difficult to manage if I were to try this. And I have poems, of course, in my own voice that that deal with this stuff. But um, trying to negotiate a particular feeling I had during that uh, period. I mean, it's ongoing. Of course, I still have some <laughs> share of frustrations with this world, but. Um, but it was especially important to me during the writing of Fast Animal to figure out a way to get at some feature of this kind of you know, boiling anger I felt about the way the world was being misled and, uh, and how willingly people seemed to go along with it. And, uh, and it did seem analogous to a kind of invisible empire of vampires, right? The vampires are everywhere, but no one really sees them. You know, and that's where that that is rooted. But um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question exactly. But uh, I don't know what was your question again. I'm sorry if I wandered off of it. Oh, th this turned out to be a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. I asked about kind of the connection between kind of the cartoon influence and oh. the um, and the elasticity, and the, the elasticity, of kind of different perspectives. Oh, uh, well, as I said, um, as and I as answered. Talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm, as I say, I'm not sure how much I perceive the work is, a, is rooted in conscious choices. I mean, you just find things and think, that, I'll write that and see what happens, you know. And, and so um, when you find yourself at the end of a book, I mean, at least for me, I, it's, like, it's like a discovery. You know, you're writing, you're writing, you're writing, and then you think, maybe this is a book because I don't, it's not like I necessarily have a, a strategy for creating books. Um, but, but over any given period of time, you know, your concerns are going to be related unless you're completely schizophrenic, right? You know, so you're going to have a series of related concerns over any given five or six years of your life. And so ultimately what I realize is that the poems are therefore going to reflect a kind of order, a kind of relatedness, 
over a period of time. Not that everything gets in the book, but you know that many things will. And uh, then the question is really, as the author, trying to imagine how to organize the poems in such a way that they tell a kind of story. This is this is not to say I'm under the the delusion that people read poetry books in order. You might, and you might, because you're readers and writers, serious readers and serious writers. But I think a lot of people just open books and just read them. And that's fine. I mean, that's all right with me, too. But, I mean, I don't think any poet puts his or her work in order so that people can look at it randomly. I mean, I really do think a book is trying to tell a story, uh, try to build a certain kind of emotional or intellectual momentum, you know, and that book is certainly wanting to to do such a thing. Um, So anyway, I'm just rambling like a mad No, it's fine. Um, We were were mentioning earlier before we started about, uh, you know, the goals that we have when we're writing and how it's a very personal thing. Um, And then you mentioned the the Merwin quote about, you know, only you can hear, you know, what you want to hear. Um, So what is it that you're trying to hear or that you want people to hear in your work or particularly in this book? Well, I mean, I, I like to think that all literature and all art, for that matter, all art, um, can have an effect on the way people think about their individual lives and about their lives in relation to the larger society. I like to think this is true. Now, I could be just crazy, but I do think when I look at my own life about people like Jimi Hendrix, for example, and how powerful an impact um, his music had on me as a, as a young dude. I was 12 when I first heard Hendrix. And um, and I've n- I've been listening to Hendrix ever since then. That's 48 years I've been listening to Hendrix. And, um, and I think, what does that mean? Well, it means that somehow he created, not knowing me at all, some something that's analogous to some parts of my inner state of being. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's the only way why else would it resonate. There's something clear that I recognize in the voices that he created. It's the only way why I would keep listening, right? And so I think that a, a good poet might be able to do that too in poems, where you write something that that someone says, "Yeah, that I hear that," and as a consequence, maybe their mind you you broaden the you, or you widen the lens through which they look at the world, or you change it completely. It depends on, I guess, how powerful the impact is, or you tilt it in a way that maybe they didn't know the lens could be tilted. And so you'd like to think that that all art. Poetry, for my purposes, but all art is in is in it's in dialogue with the culture uh, that it's in, and I like to think that, given the relatively great distance between where we are now and Utopia, <laughs> that a poem that a poem and a, and, and a, an artist or poets can can have some say in how we might reconfigure ourselves as human beings, and as a consequence, reconfigure the way we behave towards each other. And the way we behave in relation to, of course, the whole, the globe, uh, both of the human beings and also the, the entire living community that was in animal and mineral and everything else, the planet itself. But I like to think that, that, uh, that, that no one writes anything to not change someone's mind. Even if you're writing about, you know, the loss of your puppy. I mean, even if it's something that's seemingly small, you're still trying to make someone feel something that they might not have felt otherwise, you know what I mean? So you're always, to one degree or other, um, nudging a reader toward toward some kind of growth, trying to nudge uh, them out of, of uh, as Dobbins often talks about, the complacency of the reader and, of course, of ourselves as human beings. You're always trying to nudge someone out of that so they're not in the stupor. You know, they're, they're not just sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, more of the same. You want them to stop for a second and say, wow, wait a second you say that or what does that mean or why don't I feel comfortable with this I mean you have to make someone pay attention and once you have someone's attention then perhaps your mind changes and it's not like you know every poem is is like going to build a new wing in your brain but this the idea that maybe a lifetime of reading poems and poets or whatever it is that you love just adds a different layer of, of understanding or, or, or empathy or sensibility to your to your life. You know, so you like to think of a book, you know, a book like that or any book that I've written being some part of that, right, of, of changing the way people think or, or the way they imagine themselves or they imagine society or the possibilities of, of human society. You know, that's the thing. That's what you ask yourself for. But what we don't want 
is is poetry that champions the status quo. I, I, not that there is can be such a thing. I don't I'm, I don't think anyway. Um, what we want is is that that poetry and art in general, but poetry for our purposes, might be, you know, one of the forward edges of the transformation of consciousness. I mean, human consciousness, is we're still in this kind of infancy stage. I realize this, and that's why we still have wars, and we still can't figure out if people who have different or different colors are really human. And I mean, we're still clearly infants in a lot of ways. But, but poetry um, might be that aspect of, uh, or a feature of, of the foremost or the most progressive element of, of, of consciousness. Uh, it could be a feature. It can also be knuckleheaded and bad. I, I realize this, but I mean the best of poetry could be just some, just like a, a, a pointer, right? Like, and maybe the brain is not a tricycle. Maybe it's a warp engine, you know. And that's the thing. You know, you read people of all kinds, and you think, wow, man. I mean, I'm not talking just contemporaries either. I mean, you know, some such as Shakespeare wrote, or or, or Afrobin, or or. Uh, or Sappho, for that matter. I mean, it doesn't matter which direction you're looking in time. You can just see that these are some of the brightest edges of the human mind. And so often people fall back into the shadows. But someone's got to, I think, sustain the possibilities of the largest feature of the mind. We do not need anyone to promote the, 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 the least, the, the smallest features of the mind. We got plenty of that, you know. So that's that's why I think about poetry always as a as a vehicle for changing the way we might imagine society or imagine ourselves, you know. That's that's awesome. Um, so it sounds like you write really from a place of a lot of kind of social and larger consciousness and kind of you know this you you know, connecting <laughs> connecting with people and resonance and. I'm just curious, how much, you know, when you sit down in the moment to write a poem, how much are you thinking, you know, about that audience or that resonance or that connection, you know, at the very beginning, how much of that comes comes with you to the well, page? That's a good question. The first, the, the most important thing, of course, is is the poem itself. I mean, you want the poem to be as good a poem as it possibly can be. Um, I assume that. I'm going to read my poems to someone, or that hopefully someone will see the poem. So certainly in the near offing is some sense of audience. Um, I would be, and when people tell me, oh, I don't think about audience, I'm thinking, well, why don't you just put it in a journal then? Of course you think about audience. You're, you're, of course a poem is someone talking to someone else. That's what a poem is, you know. Um, and so I don't, I don't know the thing that, about audience that might have an important influence on the way I write would just be how can this thing that is itching in my brain best be understood by someone other than myself? I mean, I know what I mean. <laughs> I could just stare in the mirror and say, I know exactly what you mean, <laughs> right? But the whole idea of being an artist, I think of any kind, is to somehow um, create some means by which what you feel and sense about reality is transported into the minds and hearts of someone else. And so that's what you're trying to do. If I say the sky is blue, well, people are going to say, yeah, whatever. You know, If I say the sky is blue as the devil's testicles, people are like, what? <laughs> right? It's different, right? And people say, you stop. So the idea is that somehow you try to figure out a way to, to oblige uh, a reader or a listener to stop and really, really attend. Um, if I didn't think I had anything worth listening to, I'd shut the hell up. You know, I mean, why? Why am I going to waste all my time with these crazy ass poems or or waste people's time uh, chasing them around? Read this, check this out. You know, um, so you think you have something that might be of use in the in the in the larger discourse in the culture. So you try to write in such a way that people can hear it or or they feel compelled. To, to attend to it in a way that they might not otherwise. That affects the way I think about poems, of course. I, In the end, uh, of course, there are aspects of your own mind that are particular to you. And there are things about me that I cannot reduce. I'm just this kind of human being. Um, and so that stuff I have no power over. But I do have some power over the ways in which I can make words connect or images connect or metaphors operate. I have some power over that. 
Um, and so uh, to the extent that I can, I try to use what intelligence or I have or sensitivity or however you want to name it to create poems that, that, that oblige people or, or invite them, if that's a, a softer word, to, to pay attention and to, and to um, be, uh, be open and receptive to uh, some possibility that I'm messing around with. Um, I'm not trying to create a I don't I, you don't want your audience to be like this when you when they're listening to you you want them to be uh, take us someplace I mean in the same way that if you go to a concert a good a good musical concert I mean you know that's the the beautiful beautiful thing about a a concert is you can feel everyone has given themselves to the music Right, you just give yourself to it. That's why you see the whole crowd rock in the same way or moving their heads the same way. They are in the music. in In my fantasy world, um, poems would have that same power. You wouldn't necessarily rock your head to them. You could, depending on how how metered the work is. But uh, but that people would hear something that they would uh, that they would feel they should immerse themselves in. You know that they should give themselves to, as opposed to like that's interesting. Now uh, let's talk about those similes. I, you don't want that. What do you want is people to feel that they have been somehow just kind of uh, as as though the poems become just part of the atmosphere of of their minds for a while, and that they were in this at this reading, and they were in the reading with you. You know that's what you want. You know. And so I, I always think about how do, does one make a poem that could allow that to be? Um, and, you know, you succeed sometimes more than others. But that's uh, something I think about all the time. Or, or a lot. Mm -hmm. Not all the time, but a lot. So you talk about getting people to open up with your work. Uh -huh. um, this book in particular, um, you know, maybe in the literary sphere, mm -hmm. it was, you know, it was given a National Book Award nomination. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. When you when you wrote it, or either when, while you were writing it, or when you finished it, did you feel like you had achieved something that was maybe um, speaking to you know a particular audience, yeah. or was going to garner the attention that it did? Well, it's funny, you know. Um, I like that book, but if you'd asked me about about any book, I would have said, yeah, yeah, I really, mm -hmm. I really like this book. You know what I mean? Because it's the book you just finished. You know, you you like it. I mean, it's your book, right? But did I think it would get this kind of attention? Gosh, man, I didn't when when I when, when the press decided to. And this is the only book that's ever of mine that's been submitted uh, for the National Book Award. When they did that, I thought, well, that's nice. You know, I I just you know I would never imagine I was going to be a finalist for it. You know, I used to, well, that's nice. I mean, I like my poems, but there are lots of poets. God, I'm I'm the chair of the judge. I'm, the, I'm sorry, I'm the chair of the panel that is judging the National Book Award in Poetry this year. Mm -hmm. I'm the chair this year of this. And just looking at the stuff that's in there, now we're, we're down to five books, but there could have been 30 finalists. Easily, easily, there are so many good poets doing so many different kinds of, kinds of things. It was It's just kind of maddening to have to eliminate certain people. So I look at this book in a different light now that I'm the judge, and I think you have to have somebody along the panel has to stumble into your work and really care about it. it, it, it ha there's something that has to happen to make somebody on the panel say, I will fight for this book all the way. Because there's so many good books. Um, but that book, I admit when I finished it, I really liked it. I liked that I had some odes and some villanelles and the blade poems and the memory poems about being a teenager. I liked the mix a lot. But as I said, if you'd asked me that about um, uh, Buffalo Head Solos, I'd have said, yeah, yeah, I like the way this, this book works. <laughs> so I don't know. You know, I'm not sure I felt that it was anything in particular. I mean, I just don't, I just don't, I just can't say that I felt that, you know. But I'm so happy that someone <laughs> liked it. It's really interesting to hear you talk about the judging process, but I actually want to just jump back and say you've been talking a lot about, you've mentioned several different music, musicians, and kind of one of the things that I love so much in reading Fast Animal in particular is that you do so much with kind of musical references, and um, there's that one poem in particular, Big Big Bra Tom. Oh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. You actually have the little music notes in there. Oh, yeah, the, for the singing in that poem. That's... Yeah, and that's 
one of one of my favorite <laughs> ones. Just for that, I love that poem. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of how music kind of comes into your poetry and well, affects, affects you. That it's way. funny that you say. Well, what I'd like to do. Um, I mean, music is a kind of uh, singing is a kind of speech too, right? And so I think that the the poetry is on the same continuum of lyrics, but speaking is a di- is different than singing, as as in like syntax is different than melody, right? It's different, even though of course lyrics have syntax. But I mean, the melody does something to syntax that speaking does not do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to distinguish them. Of course, um, I just like when I can. I like the idea of integrating uh, the singing voice uh, in contrast to the spoken voice. I mean, partly because uh, I like both things and also because um, in our lives, I think those things run in and out of each other all the time. I mean, that poem, which is a poem that, that tries to capture a certain aspect of my brother, uh, I mean, he, he really did that kind of stuff. I mean, those are real things that he would do. I mean, he'd talk to you, he'd sing, you know, he'd you know, do all kinds of stuff to make his point, whatever you might imagine that to be. So a part of it in that poem, I was just trying to, to get at his way of talking to me when I was a kid. Um, but in a poem, for example, like um, 10 Miles an Hour, not that you would necessarily know this poem, but it's, it's, it's the poem that concludes... Um, uh, Hammerlock, and it's this uh, long kind of real wild poem. I was really trying to keep my foot as far from the break as I could in this poem. And there's a sequence during which the speaker is referring to a song that he is dancing to with this this woman in the poem. And so there's a song, there's a, a part of it that's sung. But there's really no, no other way of capturing the sense of the, of the music without having a singing, singing this in it. Um, I don't have the notes, though. I don't have musical notes in the margin denoting that it should be sung. I wish I did now. But uh, but uh, I just, you know, some things, you just have to have the music in there. You know, you just have to somehow. Um, uh, and that in addition to the fact that the language itself sings, right? I mean, even even the speech that we're using now, has a, a wonderful kind of flow and, and music in it. And then in poetry, we can accent the music and language. I mean, if, it, if the odes, is especially in that book, to my recollection, are really trying to maximize sound as a, as a, a dimension of those poems. And so there is a, there's a gesture towards song in, in all poetry, I think. Um, sometimes it's more sh- sharply realized than others. So I like to think that it's all in this one kind of, line and uh, uh, but I do not listen to music when I write for example that would not work I have there are two different kinds of ways of being conscious you know uh, music takes me one place writing takes me another the, the things are in violent conflict if I try to listen to anything that I care about I cannot write all I can do is nod my head and sing along I cannot write something else um, so yeah, so the way music works in me, I don't know, probably in some quiet ways that I don't understand, um, because I love instrumental music a lot, jazz and jazz, of course, but also like when you think about the solos of someone like Hendrix or Santana, for example, the way they soloed on guitar, the guitar itself is is it's um, those notes are a kind of speech, you know, they are. We don't think of them that way, but of course they're a kind of speech. Each sound is taking us someplace in understanding. It's not semantic understanding, it's emotional understanding. But in each case, just as when I'm speaking to someone, you know, I'm hoping to take them someplace with each word. Same principle is the same with notes in a solo. You know? So we have the musical aspect of the book, um, but there's also, you know, a bunch of different themes going on. You know, we have race, consciousness, um, memories, uh, mm-hmm. As you're building the collection, mm-hmm. uh, is it? Are you? Is there a particular story you're trying to tell about? You know, whether it be yourself or you know art in general or poetry. Um, but there's so many themes and they all kind of blend together. So. Well, yeah. Well, thank you for think, saying that they blend together. You hope that they blend together mm-hmm. when you're writing them. You hope that there's a sense that you're weaving a particular kind of, you know, like you're making a kind of rope out of these different themes, right? You're hoping. Um, 
And I'm sorry my answers have been so long. I'm sorry. I think oh, about no. this stuff way too much. <laughs> That's um, great. You are telling the story. I'm not sure I could define the story easily, but this book in particular, I am trying to use the book is trying to, to and one of the stories I'm trying to tell is the, the tr transformation one goes through from the relative innocence of being a kid, a teenager, to the, a more knowing aspect of mind. Um, even though parts of me are still very much, I think, I guess, you know, I still have the teenager within me, but I'm afraid for better and for worse, the teenager is burdened or all kinds of experience that change the way you, you sense the world. And I want that movement from being young to being middle aged to be to be that to be one aspect of the story that that book tells um, but you also want any book that you write just to bear witness to the to the to the work it takes to be a conscious human being and I don't mean conscious and then like wise and knowing that's not what I mean but just to be to be alert in the world requires a certain kind of, I mean, there's beauty, of course, in being attentive, but there's also torture in it to pay attention. And so you want books to bear witness to both of those things, that there's something beautiful about attending to life and attending to your own soul as, as best you can. And there's something really difficult and painful about it. Um, the world, in so many respects that we were born into, comes up short. It just comes up short. We are not given the things that we dream of. We are not given the world that makes sense. We're not given the the kind of general kindness that might li make life a, a lot more livable. It's a, the world is a very difficult place, and it's much easier to just be high all the time, you know, just to have a six pack pour like directly into your brain all the time or something, or to have a pound of weed with you everywhere you go and just like. I don't want to deal with this at all, you know. This is not to say I have anything against beer or herb. I do not. Um, but that, that to some extent, um, we must, uh, I think, anyway, that we have to bear witness to the world on our best sober mind, you know, however wild the mind or, or it may be, we have to bear witness to it so that, that perhaps um, if someone encounters uh, the book or a poem in the book, they will, will recognize a sense of community between themselves and the poet, maybe first of all, but secondarily recognize that if something that I feel or sense in the world is like something that you feel and sense in the world, that would suggest that that sensibility is shared far beyond me and you, me, and the poem. It's it's a part of the larger human, uh, the communal um, uh Thing, the communal pool of sensation and, and, and yearning and, and rage and, uh, and fun and lunacy, it's part of that. So you'd like to think that the, that the books, that a poem can point to something that suggests that the reader is not alone. I mean, I think about the poems that I love most and why I can't. I mean, the same thing with Hendrix, to be honest. I mean, the thing is, you feel to some extent that your own life has been understood um, in a way that you yourself, you always struggle with. Like, I listen to a certain kind of blues or whatever, and I think that, that's what I would say. I would say that if I could. I would say that, right? And so there's that sense that someone, someone has proven through their work that my interior is not only mine that my interior is connected to other other interiors. Now, I believe this to the bone is true, that we as, as a species are far more connected than we than our cultural idiocies will allow. Um, but in, in art, poetry for my purposes, especially in art, there are moments when we can have clear recognition of that. And that to me is, is one of the things that poetry can do for us, in addition to freeing our minds and allowing us to have some great imaginative um, uh, play, uh, but it also can remind us that we are part of a community of, of people who sense the world in related ways, not exactly the same way, but in related ways, and, and therefore should maybe be a little less inclined toward tearing each other to pieces, yeah. maybe. <laughs> I really love this great concept you have of poetry and art as bearing witness, and it kind of sounds like, in a way, you know, you've almost 
kind of with your poetry, you're trying to poetry kind of becomes an act of love for your reader. Sure. And, you know, that's kind of the sharing. I think that's that's so great. Well, it's um, that you say that. Were you going to ask something? I was just going to respond. Mm, yeah, I'll respond. Okay. Anyway, because I think about this, I was thinking about this not that long ago. Like I play guitar. I am not Hendrix. I love Hendrix. I practice a lot. I'm I'm getting better, but. I think about the time, the amount of time I've spent playing, and and how hard it is to be articulate on an instrument, and how absolutely articulate, in his way, Hendrix was. And I think you cannot do that kind of work without believing in some way that your audience is with. You cannot do this and say, "I'm just trying to show off because I think my the audience is idiots." But I'm just playing this guitar just so you know how good I am. That's ridiculous. You have to think that there's something sacred between you and the audience to work as hard as you, you did. And I think, of course, secondarily, uh, poets, I think, and all artists do the same thing. You can't think your audience is unworthy and, and work so hard to say something. It's ridiculous. Of course, of course it's an act of love. It's not something you think about necessarily on a daily basis. But of course it is. Of course, um, if you write uh, with, with such you know severity about whatever, you're not doing it because you think your audience will not understand it or doesn't deserve to understand it. You think that your audience, to some extent, is an ex- is, a, is, a, is like kin, kinfolk to you, you know? And that's why you, you try so hard to say the thing that you say, you know? All right, that's all. I'm stopping. Okay. Well, um, just, to, just to wrap up, uh, mm-hmm. you know, this act of love and kinship with your audience, um, I know that you had finished this book in 2012, and yes. then you mentioned to us, that you are wrapping up your next collection. So mm-hmm. could you just talk a little bit about that? Okay, yeah. Well, the next collection, I think I think people will see a clear link between these two collections, though. Um, there are um, important differences. Uh, the memory does feature importantly in, in the next book. Um, it's, it's, I think the lens through which I'm viewing memory is different, though, in the next book. I'm not sure I can describe it exactly. Maybe there's a... Um, Maybe there's a, a heavier shadow, maybe on the lens of this next book. Um, it it uh, also addresses a lot of the things that I'm feeling in relation to my parents, who are very old now. Uh, both of them in their late 80s, and they will probably not be around a whole lot longer. And so, uh, my mother is an Alzheimer's patient, and watching her memories disappear, and so that's. Those are things that inform the next book, in addition to other things. I mean, certainly there are political tilts moments in the, in the next book as well. The centerpiece of the book is a poem called One Turn Around the Sun, um, which is online. You may, Maybe you've stumbled into it. If you Google Split This Rock, you'll see me reading at their festival. They have a festival in Washington, D.C. every year, which I recommend that all of you go to. It's a great festival. Uh, Split This Rock from the Langston Hughes poem. Um, uh, that's where the, the organization gets its name. I'm reading this poem, One Turn Around the Sun, which is the centerpiece of uh, the next book. And it has, I mean, I was trying to do everything in that, in that book, uh, in that poem, rather. Um, it's 410 lines long. Um, it's the longest poem I'd ever written. And, uh, and it's rooted in Octavio Paz's poem, Piedra del Sol, Piedra del Sol. Sunstone. Piedra del Sol. Yeah, I think that's right. Piedra del Sol. Anyway, Sunstone. And uh, his was 500 and some lines long. And so I thought, I'm going to try a poem that has that kind of scope. But, and his poem is good, though. It just wanders everywhere. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try. Because, of course, you look at that kind of length and you think, oh, God. Well, I can't control it, but I bet you realize this. That you, you know things that you didn't know you knew about composition. And so that poem really does define, in many respects, the concerns of the whole book, though there are other things uh, in the book that might sit on the edges of that poem in, a, in terms of tone, tonal differences and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, it's about memory also, and it's also about... Um, you know, reimagining self in relation to the larger society. And you hope, even though there's more, there are more personal references in this book, 
what I'm hoping is that it doesn't, that someone reads it and they don't think, oh, Siebel's really wants us to know about him. That is not what I want. What I want, what I'm hoping for the book is that those more personal moments make the reader think of his or her own, like, interior. And hopefully there's a clear relationship between the things that I'm trying to get at dealing with my own madness that they'll recognize in themselves. I mean, that's the idea of the next book. I won't say any more because God knows, maybe I'm just saying, doing it all wrong. But I think that's a reasonable look at it. Well, thank you. We look forward to seeing it. And I sure. uh, appreciate you taking the time. Sure, it was great. Yep. Um, and thank you so much for being here with us. Yes, it was great. Let's never stop. Five hours on podcast. <laughs>